Welcome to Don't Everybody Leave. Say howdy to Mac King. Bam. Howdy. I am Mac King. <laughs> and uh, we're, I got, we got a great show. I, with Mike Cavey, my oldest friends. Maybe uh, now that uh, he's like uh, 85 years old, he's my oldest friend. Uh, maybe that now that Johnny Thompson's there. <laughs> uh, we got uh, the regulars. Uh, you want to pop them up there? Uh, what's what's Babs. your names? Babs. <laughs> There's a uh, fearless leader. Uh, Manny Grosso, Jackson, Jackson, Pat, Mike Godot. I'm Matt King. And uh, hey, boys. Howdy. Hello. Howdy. 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 And uh, monkey tested, monkey approved, Michael Godot. That's right. <laughs> Got to have the official Mac King souvenirs. Hey, do we have stickers yet? Uh, we don't have stickers. We should have stickers. We, we should need have stickers. stickers. <laughs> I would like to say that at the time that we air this, we may have merch. And so people should go to our social media platforms to find out where that is and how to buy it. Right. And yeah. And we may even have social media platforms by the time we air this. <laughs> so let's start the way we normally start. I'm, okay. a, I'm a stickler for, uh, you know, tradition. And, uh, you know, since, uh, since we all last hung out together, Leon Sphinx died. Oh. Uh, yeah. You got a picture of Leon there, Nikki? Look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So, so he, uh, <laughs> for those of you uh, who don't know or don't care, he uh, beat Muhammad Ali and won the heavyweight title, and uh, then uh, his kind, then he didn't. My, my only, <laughs> my only vision of Sphinx is when uh, Tyson knocked him out in like ninety seconds, and his eyes literally rolled back in his head. That was so, his brother. Uh, that yeah, was that was Michael, Michael Sphinx. That was Michael. Oh, that was Sphinx. Michael. Jeez, I don't even. Yeah, that was yeah, Michael Sphinx. No That's right. <laughs> No. And, I, saw uh, that, I saw that fight live. You did? Yeah, it was only 90 like seconds 90 long. seconds? Yeah. <laughs> 86, I think. 87, wow. 86. I, I've been to two Tyson fights before he was champ because he's from my area. He's upstate New York. I'm from a real small town that bordered Catskill. And I went to two of his fights, both first round knockouts that were. And I met Ray Boom Boom Mancini. He was uh, uh, announcing one of the fights. And uh, he, he like sat me on his lap. I was really young. And he sat me on his lap and gave me an autograph on my ticket stub. And <laughs> cool. It was great. I have something else to say about Leon. But before that, I want to get to Vinny. You framed your camera differently. Do you think people will think that you have hair on the top of your head? If you <laughs> oh, no, I can. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <It's a laughs> reduce the glare. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a different strategy than what I've been using. <laughs> I like it, though. I'll do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my so hairline could at least go up a little. I'll go the yeah, other way. You, <laughs> and you know, you know, <laughs> you know who didn't die? They just found a guy who got Lots lost in the Grand Canyon, December twentieth. The Grand got Canyon lost in the Grand Canyon on December twentieth, or uh, walked away from his car on December twentieth. We don't. There are not a lot of details on this story yet. It's developing as time goes along, but oh they've just reported they found this guy after fifty days. So if there aren't, if there aren't a lot of details, he may, he, he may have been traveling alone. <laughs> That's the only other detail in the article. <laughs> oh, wow. But here's what I wanted to talk to about Leon. Oh, okay. about, has about he been Leon. to the Grand Canyon? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> Le, they know where Leon is, I'm pretty sure. Right now. <laughs> Leon's, Leon's on the roof. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I was reading a little bit about him. And uh, Leon had asthma as a child and low blood pressure and was pretty sickly and uh, was beat up and bullied as a kid. So he could have either been a professional fighter or a magician, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, do you buy into that? Uh, people, that's a theory that a lot of people have that magicians get into magic because you know crappy childhood or they were bullied as kids. And I think there's I a there's some of that in almost anything. You know, like there's a small portion of people that it was an outlet to to do that, whether it's swimming or uh, magic or anything like that. But I don't I don't think you know maybe we have proportionally a little more. I don't yeah, know. I'd say magicians seem to be a little weaker than swimmers, 
Uh, <laughs> that's just like a little. <laughs> Maybe yes. stick I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> that might um, explain why jugglers are so much cooler than magicians. <laughs> I think right. that's right. Magi- yeah, jugglers are popular. In we can do school, things. Right? We can do things. Yeah, we have skills. <laughs> and that's why you jugglers can do juggling. practice. Yeah. <laughs> right. <It's> crazy. <laughs> well, some I mean, magicians doesn't... practice, Vinny. Yeah, some of these yeah. practice. I think that's one of the intriguing things to some of those, you know, some, <laughs> those people who feel like, okay, I'm going to spend time in my bedroom by myself in my underpants and a sports jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I feel uh, personally attacked. My, yeah. my Letterman <laughs> swim <very> jacket. Seen, <laughs> right. yeah. well, I mean, Udo, Udo framed it in the positive, but we also always say that, you know, jugglers aren't efficiency experts because they look at a thing and go, there's got to be a way to make this harder. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, magicians, I get there's got to be a way to make this easier. Yeah, now right. Goodell yeah. is a, is not in that group. He he looks at juggling tricks and finds a way to make them easier, but look right. harder. How can I reduce this to three objects? Right, we yeah. have <laughs> we have a basic uh, opposing view on shows. Magicians, you, the most important thing for you is to look like it's never happened. For me, the most important thing is to look like I have worked on this for a million hours, and that's a really basic difference between jugglers and magicians, I, in my opinion. Well, yeah, yeah it's, you're right. You're you're trying to make it look hard, and I'm trying to make it look effortless. Is that yeah, right? like it never happened? Mm-hmm. Like it never happened mm-hmm. before? Clueless. Yeah. <laughs> Clueless. Yeah. Or in some in some cases, you want it to look like nothing happened, right? The, the, if the thing the thing we practiced should be invisible in our case. Yeah. Yeah. And in juggling, those are the worst kinds of tricks. Tricks where you work really, really hard, and then people go, "Oh, that was that was cool." <laughs> yeah, so you're saying <laughs> I don't so, you guys want to hear a cool uh, Leon Sphinx story? Yes. Do we have to go somewhere else? (laughs) So, how are they related to the temptations? How does this get to them? Yeah. When did he meet the temptations? That's a good guess. Um, One time I was in a casino and uh, I walked past a guy sitting down in a chair and it was Leon. Uh, I hope that's the end of the. Yeah, it is. I knew it was. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Uh, Well, on that high note, (laughs) <laughs> and now he's dead. To do somebody that we know and love and want to talk to. I don't think he's my oldest, actually oldest, oldest friend, but I've known him since I was. I mean, he's I, pretty I, old. First, yeah, he is pretty old. I met him when I was uh, 17 years old or something. He signed a book to me uh, then, but uh, he didn't remember doing that. <laughs> Until later, <laughs> but I have written the forward to his uh, latest uh, magnum opus, uh, "Cave Me Wonders," and uh, "Big Giant." It's one of the great magic books, uh, certainly of the twenty-first century. Uh, and uh, there they are, right there. Oh, and yeah, and Vinny owns them. I, I, my guess is that that's the one magic book that maybe all of us own. Yeah. Is it? Probably. Do you own one, Jason? Do you have it, Nick? Uh, I had it before you did. No, probably. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that even as a juggler, no, I, I have I a copy of this. I helped unload them from the back of his van. I, I just want to say <laughs> that I'm really <laughs> happy. My copy, of, uh, my copy of Mike Caveney Wonders can beat up your copy. <laughs> Look at that. How does it start? Mike Caveney is a big, fat hypocrite. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> that's uh yeah, that's my friend. Please welcome my big fat hypocritical friend. Perfect. Or or we lost bags. There he is. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. Uh <laughs> just for the record. You guys don't need guests, okay? <laughs> Waste of our time and your time. You don't need guests. Second of all, Max said um, he didn't remember signing my book until later. Not true. I don't remember to this day. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. Okay, yeah. And another little known fact, in my youth, I was that kid that used to tease and beat up Leon Spinks. <laughs> <laughs> right? So do what you had you had a you're like I would guess uh, 
you're you're one of those magicians with a very happy, wonderful gr growing up period. Yeah, yeah. you weren't you weren't teased or bullied as a child, um, and, uh, and took up. You know, uh, I always think of that quote from Penn and Teller when they're doing the fire eating. Right, what horrible insecurities have combined to cause us to take up such a gross form of overcompensation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say that that is true. I would say, at home, if you've ever seen Leave It to Beaver, that was my family. <laughs> I had an older brother. My dad was a school teacher and then a school administrator. My mom was a mom. Uh, and wore pearls to vacuum. A absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My mom was a dancer in the movies, and she would yeah. not only would she vacuum, she would dance around the living room as she vacuumed because that was her deal. <laughs> yeah. So what movie were you in as a? a oh yes. Um, yeah, I don't. It, it's a it's a completely nothing movie, but my mom was three months pregnant with me when she danced in it. Uh. Wow. It's not important, but she was in some great movies. Great movies. Oh, that was I know. I that's uh, Citizen Kane. No. <laughs> no. No. All right, fine. She was in an American in Paris, and uh, really, yeah, oh yeah, but <laughs> it's an I unbelievable mean, movie. Oh, fantastic! Uh, but I mean, as a dancer, she, you didn't. You, I would have like to be sitting next to you and go, "There she is." That that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so. But anyway, in that uh, case, so I, I was an American in Paris too. <laughs> <laughs> so very happy pitting. childhood growing up, and uh, at a very young age, nine years old, discovered magic, and knew immediately this is it. Everything else is just a placeholder. I know I have to go to school. Okay, I'll do that. But just so you all know, this is it, <laughs> and. And unlike many magicians, I, and I know what you're talking about, they say, how do you get into magic? You suck at sports. That's what Derek <laughs> Hughes says. Um, but I was, in, I was in Little League and in junior high school and played basketball in high school on the cross-country team and the track team. So I was a runner, and I liked doing that. And the interesting thing was in those days, if you were a magician, you were a geek, total geek, if you were on the cross country team, you are such a geek; it's unbelievable. <laughs> oh no, I was and, the same. I was in the same boat. I mean, I that's the I I played little league football, little league baseball on the cross country team. But yeah, cross country was geeky. Yeah, yeah. When did you I, get into I, ice skating? Ice skating. <laughs> yeah, when I when I joined the Long Beach Mystics and started doing an act with Stan Allen, and we had visions of you know, having a bidding war between ice follies and ice capades, who was going to win the chance to have us in their show on ice. Um, so we learned how to skate, but but barely and never did anything on ice. So that picture of you uh, that Nikki brought up with uh, on the cover of Magic Magazine with the chicken, how long, when, when was the first time that you had a um, chicken in your act? Good question. 1981. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because back in those days, I was doing, I was the guy with the coat hangers. I did the linking rings with coat hangers. Not that exciting, but I was coat hanger guy. And I'd also started doing my juggling routine with the, the three arms. And then I got a phone call from Bill Larson, who said, and you have to understand, starting at age 13, the biggest thing of the year for me and all my magic buddies was Milt Larson's It's Magic Show. Beginning in November, Wilshire Ebell Theater, the greatest magicians in the world. Oh, it was paradise to go see this show. In 1981, Bill Larson calls me and says, hey, Mike, how would you like to MC the It's Magic Show? And I go, Bleh. and I try to play very cool. So I say, uh, well, I don't know. Let me think about that, Bill. Who, who have you got booked on it? And he said, well, the closing act is going to be Richie Artie. And we've also <laughs> got uh, a young kid that nobody's ever heard of named Lance Burton. So I said, okay. And now I'm thinking the reality to this. Am I really going to walk out on stage 
having, you know, on the stage with Lance Burton, who I had seen and knew already was the world's greatest magician. Am I going to walk out there with Lance Burton and Richie Artie and do the linking rings with coat hangers? And I decided the answer was no. And I thought, okay. And I had, there was months before this show. And I thought, okay, what would be a great trick? And I decided that a great trick would be is if I could get a spectator out of the audience, have him take his coat off, pull a live chicken out of his coat, and hand him his coat back, just like that. So that was my goal. And I decided that wh why am I getting this guy up? Why is he taking his coat off? And I decided, well, the answer to that question was because I'm going to pretend like I'm a hypnotist and I'm going to hypnotize him. And then to prove that he's hypnotized, I'm going to shove a pair of scissors through his coat and it's going to look like I screwed it up and tore his coat. But then when I hold his coat up, it's going to be restored. And now silverware is going to fall out of his coat like he's went out to dinner and was stealing silverware. And then after all the silverware falls on the floor, then I'm going to produce a chicken. So that was the goal. And um, and I did. I, that's the trick that I did. I did the arm juggling on its magic. I didn't do the blinking coat hangers, but I did this first version of producing the silverware and the chicken. No, I actually do have a thing I want to talk to uh, Mike about. Uh, I watched a video of you doing your act in fluent Spanish. Oh, um, yeah. El now, Gran Mago Mike? Uh, hey, hey <laughs> Gran Mago Mike, si. So, that's right. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I got, you know, Tina, Tina's act, she goes everywhere on earth. No For the non magician, problem. this is your, your wife, Tina Leonard, also a great Tina magician. Leonard with her mop act, yes. And so she goes, hey, I'm going to South America for a week. I'm, I'm going to Spain for a week. I'm, and I'm going, hey, what about me? What about me? And um, so she said, well, you should learn your act in Spanish. Now, Tina, fortunately for me, speaks fluent Spanish. She was born in Venezuela, lived there till she was 12, speaks fluent Spanish. So I wrote my script and she translated it into Spanish. And then I had to learn it. Very. Wait, what? Wait, go back. What's a script? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually have a script. And I found that learning it in Spanish was unbelievably difficult. <laughs> because not only do you have to remember what word comes next, you have to do that while you're doing a magic act. <laughs> and there's a lot right. going on while you're doing a magic act. You know, I'm st stealing a big load of silverware and a chicken, and I'm doing scissors through the coat, and I've got a spectator on stage that I'm trying to manage, all the while trying to rem What's the next line? What's the next line? <laughs> now so, imagine uh, you've got a guinea pig in your pants, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's now right. you know how hard it can get. And I would do, I did a couple shows and it, it's t horrible and you feel like you're doing your first show ever. But, um, but then we would go like to South America for a week and do a week worth of shows. And my goal was add one line each show and you yeah. get more and more comfortable and pick out a line and add it and, you know, and after a week and so on. And so I got comfortable with it and then it got really fun. And I can say that the last show that I did, like all of you, a year ago, one year ago right now, Tina and I were in Madrid, Spain for a month. Yeah, I did my act in Spanish and had a blast. ¿Gustaría café? No. No mucho. Okay. Los, uh, los pies aquí. Sí. Sí, sí, sí. Rodillas juntas. Show business. Sí. La mano derecha aquí. And when you watch video of it, I, I couldn't tell that you weren't fluent in Spanish. So, so at the end of the show, especially like in Madrid, they do a meet and greet where all the acts are out in the <laughs> lobby and a thousand people come out and they all come over and shake your hand and start talking to you. And I go, no, momento, no comprende, no, es, no habla español. And they go, why, why? We yeah. just saw you. Yeah. You no, no. The... <laughs> yeah. And they refused to believe that I couldn't speak Spanish. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. I've had that happen a lot. It's really funny to have them. And I've had in France, I've had people angry at me. Pardon, je ne suis pas un musicien. 
Bah, je suis jongleur. <laughs> je sais. <laughs> Because they thought I wouldn't speak to them. No, no, I saw your show. Talk to me. And I, I don't really speak any French. I have it memorized. Look, it's written on my arm right here, but yeah. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, you're just being a dick. Talk to me in French. <laughs> yeah. Great. It is funny in the process of learning it, how I would have cue yeah. sheets on the shelf under the stool, yeah. on the newspaper when I tear the square out of the newspaper, yeah. written on the side of the scissors. So I'm constantly reading things. <laughs> Works know, for yeah. Brando. Me too. Yeah. On my arm, I have stuff written on a unicycle. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the thing? I know my act in Spanish, Mike, by the way. Yeah. No yeah. truco de cuerda. Dos puntas y una media. <laughs> muy, muy bien, señor. Muy bien. Sí, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Grand Mago right, Mac. Just... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the fun. You've probably discovered the same thing, Mike. If you are a little off in another language, sometimes that's great. They love that. They love that you're yeah. an idiot and you can't quite speak yeah. it. But I was doing a joke in my show where I poke my head out of a trash bag and I say, Mama, like I'm a baby being born. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do it in Spanish. I go, mama. It gets no laugh. For two weeks, I say, mama. And I finally go to the guys. I go, it, it's mama, right? And they say, it's mama. Uh, <laughs> I, I say, mama. It gets a, a huge laugh. Mama, wow. nothing. Mama, big laugh. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, you so I, think, I think I was in Portugal. Mm -hmm. and, and when the food, the first spoon falls out of the guy's coat, And I didn't speak Portuguese. That's that's like Russian. Yeah. But I wanted to be able to say a spoon so everybody knew what it was that right. fell out of the coat. And now I forget the word, but it was something like forchette or something like that. <laughs> okay, forchette, forchette. I got to remember this. And again, I, I have to remember this after doing 15-minute magic act. So the spoon falls on the floor, and I pick it up and look at it, and I look at the guy, and I said for say something which i thought was the, <laughs> the word i got a huge laugh <laughs> and i thought oh man am i glad i learned that word yeah. for spoon <laughs> I walk off stage and, and they said uh, boy that got a great laugh that i said yeah that was fantastic they said you know what you said S spoon they said no you picked up the spoon and looked at the guy and said pig <laughs> What? Oh. I had a, I do a trick with a carrot and I was in That's Budapest it. and they didn't have carrots they had rutabagas or uh, turnips or some long look just like a carrot except white and when I got to that point in the show I took it out to do the gag and when I pulled it out everybody laughed And I, I, to this day, don't know what it is. But second show, I was, there's the funny thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but you guys are welcome to laugh, and then I'll do yeah. my gags. Actually, get, ask you about hecklers and if you had good heckler stories. <laughs> yeah, if, if we, any of us had a dollar. Jacob's probably the only guy on here that has a dollar. Because <laughs> it gets paid in dollars. <laughs> I have so much cash, and I'm not rich. It's really bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> bags and bags of cash, but it's all the money I have. What's your address? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell you a funny story about dollars real quick. Uh, one day, I don't know why, uh, Joy asked me to get something out of her purse for her. Uh, and so I went to her purse, and I opened it up. And I noticed that for whatever reason, she had a bunch of $1 bills. And so I took Ooh. every one of them and <laughs> folded them like stripper dollar bills and just <laughs> left them in her purse. But she didn't know that. And so, uh, two days later, she comes home and she's like, hey, thanks a lot, asshole. And I'm like, what? what are you talking about? She goes, I'm in the drive through at Starbucks. <laughs> and I go to... I go to get three dollars out to pay for my coffee, and the guy's looking at me like I know what you do for a living. She's like unfolding them really fast and trying to give them to the guy. Anyway, I just thought that was funny. Have yeah, never... you heard that story, Mike, of uh, Jacob Jason coming to my house to play poker with a bunch of cash? Oh yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> when when my friend Rod the Hop, who I believe most of you met. 
uh, yeah. when his father passed away and left him a bunch of money. And so we went to the bank to withdraw it in cash. And it was a little over $20,000. So Rod took like a hundred dollars in cash and he said, Hey, I, I live with a bunch of kind of shady characters and I don't want this cash at my house. Can you hang on to it for me? And I said, sure. So I had two packs of $10,000 each, a hundred, hundred dollar bills with the little bank wrapper thing looks just like we had robbed the place. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll hang on to that for you. Um, and so I dropped Rod off at the house and what he didn't know that I didn't really think to tell him is that I was going from his place straight to Matt King's house to play poker. <laughs> and so, so I, I walk in the door and I've got 20 grand on me. <laughs> And uh, there was some, I guess, was it Mac? Was it your attorney or somebody's attorney that was playing yeah. with us for the yeah, first the attorney, time? One of the Caesars attorneys, actually. I was sucking up to him. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so there was him. There was, yeah, our, my friend Mark, who's an attorney. And then there was somebody else who, uh, you know, not a magician. Yeah. So I walk in and I sit down and and Max getting the chips ready and it was a $20 buy-in, which is what we always kind of played. And so I reach into my pocket and I say, Mac, uh, still $20,000 buy-in, right? And I slap those two $10,000 packets down. And Mac doesn't miss a beat. He's like, yep, that's right. And he grabbed them and just set them aside and went back to cutting checks out. And so this guy's face kind of goes <laughs> for a second. And I don't remember if he pulled you aside and said, hey, Mac, I thought it was $20 or, or what. <laughs> and you, you let him off the hook. Uh, yeah, we let him off the hook pretty quick. Yeah, what made me think of that is then when you got home that night, too, there's right. a little coda to that there's story. There's a little more. So I get home, and I I don't know why I came in third or fourth in the poker tournament. I think Pete Studebaker may have won that night. But I get home, and I leave a note for my wife that says, had a good night at Matt King's poker game. Um <laughs> You know, and uh, I left the twenty thousand sitting on the counter with that note for her to find uh, when she came down and to go to work the next morning. Uh, but so, uh, it ba- it backfired on me because she woke me up at like six in the morning and goes, "Did you really win twenty thousand dollars at that King's Poker?" <laughs> so, Mike, when you were in uh, Spain with Jorge Blas, did you do the chicken trick? I did. Um, and how did you get the chicken there? Jorge doesn't even ask. He knows that when he hires me, he has to go find a chicken. Uh, is it What's it like working with a chicken you've never worked with before versus one that you've done the trick with many, many times? Excellent question. Um, I can kind of do this trick with any chicken, but they people always say, how long does it take to train a chicken? Well, you don't really have to train them. Uh, <laughs> you have to tame them. You have to get a chicken to be comfortable with you. So when I go to a place and they've gotten me a chicken, you got to take it to dinner first. (laughs) I spend a lot of time just with the chicken in my hand sitting so that she knows when she feels her, my hand under her two feet, nothing horrible is going to happen. So she gets comfortable. She has plenty of air, plenty of light. It's kind of like wearing a a tight t-shirt, you know, (laughs) It's no big deal. So she just sits there. Uh, and then when she comes out, she's comfortable. And it, I know how to make a chicken flap her wings. And so I make her flap her wings and she looks three times bigger. Um, so, yeah, I can I've many times gotten a chicken that day and used her that night. And but many wow. times in, in the past, you've traveled with a chicken, too, though. Right. Flown. Yes. <laughs> Are we going there now? Sure, let's go there. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm excited. <laughs> but I became an absolute expert smuggling chickens on and off airplanes. I did it for many, many, many years and had many, many techniques from very simple to very complicated. And all of them worked varying degrees of success. <clears throat> but the chicken's not in the rule book. And and so right. every airport kind of makes up their own rules and every airline makes up. They don't know what to do. So it would go from um, 
What's in the cage? A bird. I always would say a bird instead of a chicken because a bird, okay. They, uh, they Usually they think, well, he's got a parakeet or canary or something in the bird, and so they don't even look. But then sometimes they look and they, and they go, oh, that's, that's a chicken in there. Oh, yeah, it's that's a magic no chicken. bird. <laughs> yeah, I know. So And now they go, oh, and I say, yes, it's a magic chicken. And half the time they would call the other people over and say, oh, look at the little chicken in there. Oh, it's the cutest little thing. Go ahead. One lady said, that's not a bird, that's a chicken. And I said, well, <laughs> we're both right. Uh, so it, it became so nerve-wracking. Every time I was going to fly that night, I wouldn't be able to sleep. What if I can't get on? What if they stop me at the gate? What if they, what if they take the chicken away? What if a million horrible things could happen? So I ended up inventing a technique. <clears throat> I would get to, oh, so I had a little shoulder bag, a little nylon shoulder bag, like a sports thing. And in there was a, the chicken cage, the traveling chicken cage. It had nice sawdust on the floor. It had food. It had water. She's completely happy in this little house, in the shoulder bag. So I would get to the airport. I would always wear my chicken smuggling coat. I would always have a, a pen in this pocket. And I would first go to the men's room, go into the stall, take the chicken, put her in my load bag, hang the load bag off the pen under my coat, put the coat over. So now there's a little bump here with the chicken in it. I would always have a newspaper in my hand. So I could, if I carried the newspaper like this, it, it would kind of be on top of the lump that was the chicken. Now I would take the empty chicken cage in the shoulder bag, put it on the belt, run it through x-ray. I'd walk through the, the x-ray thing. No alarm went off. I would walk through. I'd pick up my shoulder bag. I would keep walking into the next men's room where I would go into the stall, go, <laughs> produce a chicken out of nowhere. The chicken would say, where's the audience and who's booking us into these toilets? Anyway, <laughs> then I put the chicken back in the cage and I'd be on my way. The perfect crime. I did it dozens and dozens of times. I felt completely invincible. <laughs> this can't fail. I've thought this through so well. Until the day that I was flying somewhere <clears throat> and I put the thing on the on the belt and I walk through and there's no, no alarm goes off. And so why did this lady go, what's that? What, what's what right here? Oh, well, that's my newspaper. No, no. What right here? Oh, that's my coat. No. What's that underneath your coat? What's that? And it's like, how can this be happening? Why, why, why is she touching that? And so I panicked. And I looked her right in the eye, and instead of answering her question, what is that, I asked her a question. I said, do you know what a colostomy bag is? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, go ahead. And the conversation was over. Amazing. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Wow. Poor Smetty's under my coat going boom, boom, boom with my heart pounding. <laughs> Holy oh. Christmas. So I, I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. But in that, in that flight home, I think I, I was maybe awake, but maybe dreaming. And I thought, okay, here's what I have to do. <laughs> I need to get a, make an actual colostomy bag that says colostomy bag and get a piece of clear plastic tubing and fill it with split pea soup and attach that to one end of the colostomy bag and be able to put the chicken in there and strap this thing to my chest and have the little tube go down my pants or something. And then when they say, what's that? I can go, it's a colostomy bag. You want to inspect it? And I thought that would be the ultimate perfect crime. And then I must, I think that I got you sent to Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. What happened to the lady that said it wasn't a bird. It was a chicken. How did that end? Lady, I think, I think when she said you you can't that's a that's like bringing a cow on board. She sent me away, and so I went over and sat 
and thought, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. And I saw her go on a break. And I picked up my chicken, who's now back in the shoulder bag in her cage. And I thought, and I this wasn't something I just did off the top of my head. I had done a little research. <clears throat> I put the shoulder bag with the chicken in it on the belt and ran her through the x-ray machine. So I went through street legal, uh, you know, and the guy on the x-ray machine is watching things, you know, and he sees this chicken skeleton go by <laughs> and didn't say anything. Uh, and I got through that way. In Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from, a number of years ago, they uh, said, hey, we're going to name the local assembly the Mac King Assembly in my honor. I was very excited, honored. Uh, Mr. Caveney, are you a member of the SAF? Well, uh, that's a, not such a simple question. So here's the story. Do you think, what would happen if my chicken joined the SAF? And he went, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. Let's fill out an application, run it up the flagpole, and see who salutes it. So I got an application. Name, Smetty Cochin. She's a Cochin hen. Mm -hmm. And all my chickens have been named Smetty. Smetty Cochin. Address, 572. Put my address. <clears throat> um, number of years interested in magic, five. Um, main interest, stage magic, eh. Close up, nah. Assistant, yes, assistant. <laughs> so I fill this whole thing out. I put 40 bucks or whatever it is. I send it in. Thinking I'm a week later, I'm going to get a phone call from the SAM going, are you out of your mind? What's the matter with you? This is an organization for magicians, not pets. Never came. I get a big envelope back in the mail. The Society of American Magicians, the, oh, my God, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Member of good standing, Smetty Cochin. <laughs> Unbelievable. And who's the president? I, Rich you know, Dooley. The president, it's always some insurance Rich salesman. Dooley. Yeah. Oh, wait, man. wait. Vinny, Vinny Grosso was at one point the president of the SBA. <laughs> Not that long Years ago. Years after yeah. that one. Yeah. Uh, so was Harry Houdini. So, okay. But, uh, <laughs> But so now I'm thinking, I can't one of these believe. things is not like the other. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm thinking, how do I get my cow registered? Clearly, it's the Rich same. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, I can't believe, you know, they sent her a membership pin and, uh, you know, which she does not like. Well, no, I put it on her once. That was enough. So that's an SAM. They picked you over Lance Burton. Uh, the IBM ring in Louisville okay. is named after Lance Burton. Nice. That's great. That's great. When you guys were sleeping in a little trailer at Tombstone Junction, you did not imagine that the IBM oh, no. ring and the SAM assembly would be named after you. And that someday Lance would be on The Tonight Show. <laughs> and Mac would still be at Tombstone Junction. <laughs> Isn't that true, Mac? Uh, someday, yeah, I think he was on the Tonight Show. Yeah. Lance's first Tonight Show, which was 1981, you still did two more years at Tombstone Junction. Correct. Which is yeah. so it was Mike, sort the, of a tortoise and a hare. Mike, the story <laughs> that you told about uh, its magic was that it wasn't the Lance Burton on the Tonight Show because Richie Artie, they didn't want Richie Artie. From that it's magic show who was supposed you to know, be you know i i yeah, just 80. heard that story it's amazing it's 81 and lance drove out from kentucky and uh they always took one act off the it's magic show because milt's good buddy john shrum was the art director for the tonight show and they put him on the carson show and they milt said got a fantastic act richie arty put him on the tonight show and they said oh a week ago, we had Doug Henning, who, you know, was fantastic, and he pulled, pushed out big box and did a big illusion. Have you got something that isn't like a guy with big boxes? 
uh, yeah, we got this young kid. And Lance. <laughs> Boom. Show is a shaky set of circumstances, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> so Doug Henning is responsible for Lance Burton's career. Or the end of Ricciardi's. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can take that further. You know, Doug Henning is responsible for Michael Goudeau's career, who was hired by Lance Burton. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, that's right. I'm telling you, the whole thing is a house of cards. <laughs> yep. Let me Ooh, take a drink out of my oh, coffee wow. cup here. I love it. You're not the first person on this program to take a drink out of that coffee let me, cup. Let me set it up. This really is a Johnny Carson Cup. It came from Johnny's nephew, Jeff Sotzing, who was a producer on The Tonight Show. And we, at one of our Los Angeles Conference on Magic History conventions, we had Jeff come and talked about Carson and all the magicians that were on, and we had a little display. And anyway, Jeff ended up giving me this cup. So this is a real Johnny Carson Cup. And we had it on display. Oh, that's another story. Um, <laughs> At the end of the conference, we're cleaning out our exhibit room where this was displayed, and I didn't have the keys to the uh, showcases. And Jason said, you want that showcase open? And I said, yeah, I got to go find the keys. He said, no, you don't. And he goes over and lock picks the thing open. So anyway, <clears throat> later, what happened? Well, I'm standing there with Eric Mead and Derek Delgadio, and we've just just use lock picks to open up the display case and we got Carson's mug and the three of us are huge Carson fans. So we're in that little small museum area and no one else is in the room and the doors were locked. So we kind of looked around and poured water into Carson's mug and passed it around and each took a <laughs> sip out of the, uh, the, the magic vessel there and then dried it off and put it back in the display case. And I think we wound up telling you about it. Yeah, so I, looking to play a joke on whoever would fall for it, went out and bought one of those mugs uh, on eBay. And the uh, the real Carson mug, I think, has his photo on it and maybe his name. His, yeah, his, his name, name on the one back. side and photo on the other. Right. So I think that the mug I bought from one side looks real. Like it might have Carson's picture on it, but the back just says The Tonight Show. But nobody would know that unless you had both of them to examine it. So I bought one and have it here at the house. It's in my magic room. And uh, I sent Derek a message saying, hey, do you know what happened to Carson's mug? Caveney can't find it after we left the room. And he said, no, I, I don't. And he, that was it. I left it like that for a couple of weeks or so. And then I eventually sent him a picture of it as if I was admitting to the theft. And he fell for it for about 30 seconds or so. He was like, what, what? did you take that? And then he realized, no way, something's not right here. You wouldn't have stolen that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, that, was the, uh, that, that was the epilogue to that joke is that I convinced him that I had stolen it. Let's talk about Robo Chicken for a second because Robo yeah. Chicken- Yeah, you were starting a lot of to people, talk about Robo Chicken and I went back to the live yeah. chicken. They, people don't understand how good Robo Chicken looks um, from stage because it fooled me at the castle. You used Robo Chicken one night, and yeah, I didn't I realize it. You know, it I know. Great. There's, yeah, there's lots of stories about art magician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But I know yeah. chicken. <laughs> but um, yeah, Robo Chick. It cost. I won't even. I can't tell you how much it cost because you would say <laughs> you got to be kidding me. You're out of your freaking mind. But it was many, many thousands of dollars, but it allowed me to continue doing the, my act. This is the end of my act, not only in America, but all over the world. So it was a good investment. But a, a real live chicken, the way their wings fold up and then unfold and flap and refold is unbelievable. All the little muscles and bones that make that happen. And trying to duplicate that, I would say, is impossible. Now, this is the best company. It's called Animal Makers. They make every animal in Hollywood. And they're fantastic. So 
so this chicken looks beautiful. And in a still picture, in fact, we have a still picture. Uh, can Nikki put up a picture of <clears throat> me with a, okay, there, that's RoboChick. <laughs> That's up in wow. uh, Toronto, Canada, I think. I remember doing a show somewhere. Max Maven was in the audience. And whoever was sitting next to Max, I produced the chicken. And they went, wow, is that a real chicken? And Max said, oh, yeah, that's a real chicken. I've been to Mike's <laughs> house. I've seen that chicken. I didn't realize when you sent me that picture. Or, uh, that it was Robo ago, chicken. That, that was the, yeah, <laughs> Robo chicken. So Richard Kaufman wrote me once and says, hey, I hear you have a a me fake mechanical chicken. I'd love to see it. And I said, well, pull out the last Genie magazine. It's on the cover of your magazine. And he went, <laughs> what? He said, you got to be kidding. That's it. I said, that's it. So in still picture, it looks great. Let's tell at the end of a show when somebody says, um, how do you get that thing? How do you get that thing through the airline, you know, on board? Air? Then I know I fooled them because they're thinking, wow, can this guy really travel with a live chicken? So then I know she's done her job. But so now if the TSA know. agent says, that's not a bird, you can go, yeah, you're right. Correct. That's right. It, yeah. Correct. You're right. It's a bomb. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. When I used to travel with a real chicken, which was completely safe, they would say, oh, my God, you can't bring this on an airplane. And now that I travel with RoboChick, and I've looked, when she goes through the x-ray, there's wires and batteries, and I mean, it is a time bomb. Just we we talked more than enough with Mr. Mike Caveney. That's how I feel. <laughs> I second the motion. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Michael. Yes. I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. What's my favorite thing from today's show? Uh, you know what? This is going to seem a little obvious, but I bet it's Mike Caveney. <laughs> uh, all right, good. My favorite thing on today's show is, in fact, Mike Cave. How can it be that we all we all own Mike Cavey's book? Like I said, there's uh, yes, those books in limited quantities are still available. MC Magic Words. Yeah, uh, we're going to end as we do every uh, every week, uh, Mike, with a quote from my good friend George Clinton. There's nothing that a proper attitude won't render. Funkable. See you guys on the next Don't Everybody Leave. Okay, you tell them. All right, you ready to tell them. Hey, hit the button to subscribe, okay? He said it. Watch those scissors go right through the middle of the coat like that. Notice the only expression on his face is one of amusement. <laughs>